welcome back everyone. I hope you had a great coffee break. Um, so we're going to hear more about ARM. Uh, so Julius, that's your stage and let's hear about Trusted Firmware. Okay, thanks. Um, is this thing on? Or? Okay, great. Uh, so hi everyone, I'm Julius and uh, I work for Google on Chrome OS Firmware. I'm also the uh, core boot maintainer for ARM architectures. And I also wanted to talk about trusted firmware today. So when I signed up for this talk, I actually didn't know that Arm would also be here and talk about trusted firmware. So one of this, some of this may be a little duplicate. But my main focus for this talk is uh, a broad introduction to people who have no idea what trusted firmware is, who maybe know Core Boot and don't really know why the two have been like why, why Core Boot is using trusted firmware these days on ARM64 systems. Um, actually, when I uh, thought about this talk first, my uh, intention was to do uh, just a general core boot on ARM64 talk. Uh, two years ago in San Francisco, I already gave a talk about core boot on uh, ARM32, and this was supposed to be kind of the next iteration of that. But when I looked into this more closely, I realized that in, on the core boot side, there's really not a lot of difference between 32 and 64-bit ARM. There's, of course, the ISA is a little different. There are some differences in the details, but for the general core boot framework, it all pretty much works the same. And the differences compared to x86 core boot are also uh, pretty much all the same. So if you look at that old talk, most of these things are still true for 64-bit ARM uh, platforms. The one real difference in how core boot works these days on these platforms is the trusted firmware part. So that's why I chose to focus on that. And um, to start the motivation of what we, why we even need this trusted firmware, um, it actually has to do with the expectations that Linux has to the firmware environment. So this is a little excerpt from the uh, device tree documentation in Linux. The device tree is this thing uh, which is essentially a big table of hardware description that the firmware passes to the kernel to, so that the kernel knows how that, uh, how that particular hardware is laid out. And um, as you can see here, this part talks about CPU runtime power management, so turning CPUs off and on uh, to save power. And uh, on ARM32, that part was still optional. On ARM64, it's now required that we have this weird PSCI thing. So um, in order to figure out what that is and how we get there, how we can support that with our firmware, you have to follow me on a journey through the trust zone. <laughs> I mostly put this up because I sometimes get the impression that people who don't know the ARM architecture that well um, just have heard this term trust zone somewhere but don't really know what it means and think it's this kind of scary thing that uh, runs the evil code that spies on you or the DRM stuff or something. So um, trying to take some of that fear away, it's really um, not that complicated because if, so if you're running open source firmware, essentially you can also run an open source trust zone. It's really just... Uh, uh, an architectural feature to run code outside of the context of the kernel. So whoever has seen the previous talk, this is a very similar slide essentially, uh, just telling you what this trust zone uh, stuff is. It's essentially comparable to system management mode on x86 with the difference that system management mode is a really ugly legacy thing. And uh, this is a much nicer and cleaner extension of the existing architecture. So you essentially just take the existing concept of kernel and user land and expand it to another level. So in the same way, user land makes system calls to the kernel. The kernel can make these secure monitor calls to the next exception level up there. And um, the, the whole trust zone isn't just the part down there, but it's the whole part on the right side. So it's like a whole separate operating system and user land that can run these trusted applications that are secured from the, uh, from the rest of the operating system. And this, is, this barrier is sort of a one-way street. So the secure stuff can still access the non-secure stuff, but not the other way around. And there's also no true, uh, no true memory virtualization on this uh, right side over here. So the, the secure OS can actually uh, access the secure monitor memory and thus attack the secure monitor, essentially. Unless, of course, you have those new architectural features which we just heard about in the previous talk. And um, the, the reason of that secure monitor down there is essentially to arbitrate between these trusted applications that run your DRM stuff or whatever you want them to run and the, the main operating system. That's why it's at the highest 
Uh, it's called exception level in ARM64, but that essentially also means privilege level. So user land is level zero, kernel is level one, hypervisor is level two, and then the secure monitor is the most privileged thing at level three. And um, this, the definition of this memory barrier is actually very uh, completely SOC specific. So there's no, there's no architectural way in the ARM architecture to, to say which parts are secure memory and which parts are non-secure memory. Every SOC has its own thing for that. And usually it's just some sort of range register where you say, okay, starting from this offset for this size, that memory area is part of secure memory. And um, it's not just memory, it's the whole physical address space, actually. So also all the MMIO peripherals, you can say that they only belong to the secure world and then the non-secure world cannot access that particular I2C controller or something like that. Um, if we want to figure out why we need this uh, to support Linux, um, we got to again go to the CPU power management stuff. So if you, in case you know in Linux, uh, CPU power management called CPU idles, essentially turning off a CPU when you don't need it to save power. And if you ignore this slide for a second on ARM32, this was completely handled within Linux. So when Linux decides it doesn't want to use the CPU, then it uh, turns the CPU off, turns all the power rails off that go to it and runs the wait for interrupt instruction on that CPU. And then when the CPU wakes back up, it comes back right into Linux and Linux does all the reinitialization for that. Um, the problem is if you have this trust zone on the side, you can't really do that because the trust zone also needs the CPU, right? So first of all, you need something when Linux decides, I don't want the CPU right now, then you need something else to uh, ask the secure part if it also doesn't need the CPU right now. Maybe you need to keep the CPU alive because the secure part needs it. Um, and the other thing is, there is, so if you turn the CPU completely off and then turn it back on, then it has lost all its state, of course. And um, some of that state is not accessible to the kernel. For example, the page table base address register, there's one for the kernel, but there's a separate one for the trust, uh, for the secure monitor. And of course, the kernel cannot write the page table base address of the secure monitor because uh, that would violate the security model. So in order to reinitialize the CPU after it was completely off, um, those parts that belong to the secure monitor also have to be reinitialized by the secure monitor. And that's why every CPU on, off and on cycle essentially has to go all the way through the secure monitor and back down to the kernel. And um, ARM has defined an interface, a standardized interface for this called PSCI, Power State Coordination Interface, uh, which builds upon these uh, secure monitor calls, which are essentially like system calls just going to the secure monitor exception level. And um, now you could ask, so one, one interesting thing is that this trust zone architecture already existed on ARM32. It was sort of bolted on in some of the later stages of the uh, iterations of the architecture. But you could also have it there and you would al already have the same problems there. But the thing is, since um, this evolved alongside Linux, uh, Linux always supported systems that just didn't choose to use it. And in core boot, we just never really had a need for a secure or so secure applications, and that's why we just ignored it and used Linux's ability to work without that. But for ARM64, Linux essentially decided to have a clean break, and now they say all the systems are going to have this trust zone stuff anyway, so we can just rely on it being there, and we don't need to implement all this uh, CPU power management ourselves anymore. So the real reason why ARM64 devices need to provide this PSCI stuff now is essentially because Linux just got lazy and they just decided they don't want to implement the CPU power management themselves anymore. So now we got to give this to them in order to host the full uh, Linux platform, even if we don't want to use the secure part. Um, now we could implement all of this ourselves in Core Boot, but before we do all that work, that work, let's maybe look around to see what other options there are. So what is this trusted firmware thing anyway? Uh, for those of you who've been in the previous talk already, most of this is the same. Um, it's a full firmware stack. It's sort of a reference implementation by ARM for the, all the firmware you need, both booting and runtime firmware. And um, if we look from the core boot point of view, core boot is already the boot firmware essentially, so we don't need that part, but we are really interested in this runtime part. Um, thankfully, trusted firmware is already split out into these separate stages. And the one called BL31 is the one that really interests us because that is the part where all this runtime power management stuff is hosted. That is the secure monitor that needs to stay resident across the whole uh, lifetime of the system. And um, 
if we compare it with what Core Boot already has, it has a bunch of these nice features that Core Boot traditionally didn't provide. For example, right now on Core Boot, uh, in the ARM architectures, we have no multiprocessing support at all. We just use the one CPU core we boot with and do everything with that, which makes it really nice and easy for us. But of course, if you want to provide these services that turn CPUs off and on, you need to do some multiprocessing, you need to handle coherency and uh, mutexing and all that sort of stuff. Um, it also has a lot of nice CPU core support. So for every CPU core that ARM releases, A53, A57, A70, whatever they're called, um, all of these have a lot of their own little quirks and they have the little erratas that you need to support. So it's really nice to have a code base where the CPU vendor itself already programmed all of that stuff so that you can just use it for them. You don't have to keep up with all the new errata as they come out, essentially. Um, actually, more than once on one of our existing ARM systems, I've just booted up a new version of Trusted Firmware, and then it told me in some log message, hey, there's this new errata I found that your CPU is susceptible to. So it's kind of nice to get this thing from the CPU vendors who know what they're doing and don't have to do it yourself. Um, if we compare this Trusted Firmware architecture with Core Boot, more closely, we can see that it's matching up pretty well. So the BL1 and BL2 part are the pure boot firmware part of trusted firmware, which is essentially equivalent to the three stages of core boot that we know. And then the BL32 and BL33 are actually not part of trusted firmware. It's just names trusted firmware gives to the other stuff that it loads. And it's therefore equivalent to the core boot payload, which is also not part of core boot, but is a boot loader that is run after core boot is finished, essentially. So if we want a secure monitor on core boot, we really don't need to care about all this other stuff. We can throw all of that away. All we want is the secure monitor part. It would be really nice if we could just yank it out of there and smash it in over here, which is essentially exactly what we did. So um, we integrate Trusted Firmware as a Git submodule into core boot. So when you check out the core boot source tree, you automatically have the Trusted Firmware source tree there as well and can develop in it. And when you build core boot, uh, it also builds trusted firmware and then picks the right part that BL3 run out of it and integrates it into Corewood at the right place. So it all works out pretty nicely. And um, if you're curious about the details of how this is implemented in Corewood, um, the nice part of Corewood is that most of it is arch architecture independent, right? So all this logic about figuring out, for example, where this payload is and how to load it and put it in place, that's all independent of the architecture and we don't need to touch that. The only thing we are touching is really the very last part of the RAM stage where it jumps to the payload. That's an architecture specific callback. And all we do for trusted firmware there is essentially we're saying, if we're running trusted firmware, then instead of jumping to the payload, wait a second, let's load this other thing over here first and run it. And then we pass trusted firmware the information of how to jump to the payload. And the payload is already noted, so the nice thing is Trusted firmware doesn't really need to know anything about how to access the flash or something like that in these architectures. The, like, the next stage is already loaded and we just tell it how to move on after it's done its thing, essentially. Um, this is a quick overview about uh, how the trusted firmware repository is laid out. So my goal here is essentially to give you a rough idea of where to look if you have to implement your own SOC for, um, like if you're implementing an SOC in Core Boot and want the trusted firmware support to get it working on ARM64. This is just a, a small uh, excerpt of the directories there. A lot of these, uh, like I, I left the ones out that you don't need to care about essentially if you only care about Core Boot. So next to the BL31 directory, there's also a BL2 and a BL1. You can just ignore those because we are not using those. There's a lot of really good documentation. So if you're trying to work on trusted firmware, my uh, recommendation is really to look at those because they're great, it's especially this uh, porting guide is essentially your one-stop, uh, one-shop stop for uh, implementing a new platform. It tells you all the macros you need to define, all the functions you need to implement and so on. Um, if you're looking for drivers, they're all sorted by uh, vendor. So if you're looking for the generic interrupt controller, for example, that most SOCs use, that is under ARM. If you're looking for a standard 16.550 UART, which most SOCs use, that is under TI in this case. Um, but most of the drivers that cannot be reused between SOCs are just in the platform part over here. So actually a lot of the, like the, the framework is pretty lean and a lot of the stuff is just implemented in the platform and every platform does it however it thinks it wants to. One of the few things that you still have um, generic for all platforms to use. The CPU stuff is pretty great. So as I said, they have 
all the CPUs already implemented, and you essentially just need to add the right CPUs that your SOC has in the make file, and then it builds them, and then it can automatically detect which CPU is which. So when it brings up a CPU, it reads the identification register and searches for all the CPUs you compiled in, which one this is and which code to use for that. And um, yeah, as I said in the platform, first of all, there's a comment platform directory. So there's a lot of callbacks for things which the platform can change if it wants to, but usually most platforms just want to do the one thing that makes sense to most of them. So there's a bunch of stuff implemented in common that you can just link in because it will probably work for you. And um, then every platform does its own thing. There's usually a, a plat setup thing that is the first thing that runs doing boot and does all the boot initialization. There's a PM thing usually that implements the, those pesky callbacks and uh, a lot of vendors uh, sort of factor out some of the common stuff and then the per SOC stuff. And in the end, um, your, each platform has a makefile that defines all it does essentially. So there's no... Um, there's no complicated configuration framework here. It's not using kconfig or anything. All the compile time configuration options you have are just options in the make file and then essentially which drivers you link in in the make file. Um, so if you want to support a new platform for core boot, the one thing you really need to implement is this pesky stuff. So let's look into that for a bit. Um, and th the main message here is essentially it's very flexible. You can do whatever you want, whatever is best for your SOC. So each of the things that you can turn on and off essentially for runtime power management, um, you have these nodes at the bottom, uh, which are in a hierarchy of power levels. And then the bottom level, you always have the CPU, or in case of multi-threading, that would be the threads actually. And then you can have as many layers above that as you want. You don't need to have any layers, but most SOCs uh, have their CPUs in some sort of cluster. And when you turn off all the CPU in a cluster, then you can turn off some extra stuff for the cluster. So this power level stuff allows you to uh, build the topology of your SOC in the framework, essentially. And you, you just tell it which maximum power level you want to have, and then it handles all the stuff of uh, calling the right functions for each power level to turn them on and off, for example. And um, orthogonal to that, you also have power states. So there's not just on and off. There can be as many as you want in between to have a trade-off between uh, exit latency usually and power draw. So um, rather than just turning it off, you can maybe put it into a retention state that it can wake up from quickly. And there again, you can have as many states as you want. You can define all of that inside your platform. Uh, the only thing you tell the outside framework is whether this is an off state or a retention state. The difference there is that in the off state, it loses all its uh, state and you have to, like the framework will reinitialize all of the state for you when it comes back up in the retention state, it's expected to keep that. And then the only thing you really need to implement once you've decided how this hierarchy looks is uh, a, a structure full of function pointers essentially, which with all the callbacks for how do I turn off the CPU or, or any of these nodes, actually not just CPUs, how do I turn it back on? What do I do with it after it's turned back on? So that is this finish callback down here. And uh, there's a bunch more, but the, the general gist of it is this, that you just have this uh, bunch of functions you need to implement, and then the framework knows how to call you correctly. Um, so that's really all you need for the pesky stuff. And once again, the documents are really great to look into how this works in specifics. And also, of course, just lo look at existing platforms. My favorite is always the Rockchip one, because their SOCs tend to be really simple. They don't have any of the weird hooks and crannies that uh, some of the other more complicated SOCs have, so they usually make a good example. Um, once you have that, you're essentially done supporting core root, but you can do some more stuff if you want to. So one of the common things you might want to do is custom SMCs. Of course, this pesky also uses SMCs, and all of those are already implemented in the framework, so you don't need to worry about those, but you can add your own if you want to. A uh, common thing that we need, uh, find that we need is one time uh, DDR frequency scaling, for example, because if you do anything that involves memory, since memory is used by the whole platform, usually it needs to go through the highest privilege level to allow that. And it's also pretty simple. Um, they essentially have a macro that you can use to define a handler for a given range of SMC function IDs. Um, there's actually this whole big specification from ARM that tells you which SMC function ID ranges are allowed to be used by whom. Um, usually the one you want to use is called the SIP range. I always forget what it stands for, but it's essentially the SOC vendor range. So if you're implementing an SOC port, that's usually the one you want to use. Um, and last but not least, we have some fun core boot support in there now. Um, 
one of the problems if with integrating coreboot is that there's not yet a great way to pass parameters in a generic way from coreboot into trusted firmware. This is something that I think the trusted firmware team is interested in making better in, in the future. But right now, all that they have is uh, essentially you can have one pointer of platform specific information, and then the platform has to figure out how to deal with that. So, when you, the first piece of platform code that's called when you are in trusted firmware is usually the function over there, which uh, gets that one pointer and then you have to figure out what to do with that. Usually we find that we have to pass a bunch of things from core boot into trusted firmware, so what we do is we build a sort of primitive linked list with that and then parse it uh, when, like, at the very first thing in trusted firmware. Um, and one of the things you should pass is the core boot table based it with, because then you can use this core boot table setup function which we have in trusted firmware, which gives you all the core boot uh, the, the generic core boot support that we implemented, which is right now mostly console support. So, for example, after that, you have access to the console, uh, the UART uh, information over there, so you don't have to hard code the UART base address anymore. You can use the one from core boot. And more importantly, um, you essentially take over core boot's configuration with that. So if you disable the UART and core boot K config, then it would just not pass that, and then trusted firmware will also not use it, which is nicer than having to disable stuff in every... Uh, every different repository your firmware is made of. Um, the other nice thing you get with this automatically is CBMEM console support. So as soon as you, like if you have a CBMEM console in core boot, then information about that is passed in the core boot table and then trusted firmware will automatically register a console driver for that. And then once you boot into user land, you can uh, dump the CBMEM console and see all the trusted firmware logs right after the core boot logs. Um, I think this is, pretty much all I want to talk about about the basic trusted firmware um, architecture. The one thing I want to leave you with is a little anecdote about um, some of the practical problems we had when implementing one of these SLCs in trusted firmware. This is about the Rockchip 3399 and um, well we essentially had some trouble fitting everything there. Um, the story starts very simple with uh, bringing up the chip and uh, trying to get suspend resume support working. So of course the whole system suspend resume also needs to go through the secure monitor because it, it turns off the whole system so the highest privilege level needs to know about it. And um, you usually turn on, like the DDR controller usually uses a state during that so you have to reinitialize it somehow when you come back up and of course the code for that can't be in DUM. So um, thankfully we are an ARM SOC, we usually have a bunch of SRAM so we can put it in there. Um, and we have quite a lot of SRAM on this platform, so that's pretty easy to fit. Um, then we had some other issues about uh, we want to do some DDR frequency scaling at runtime. Depending on the SOC, this is sometimes pretty easy and sometimes a real chore. On this one, it was thankfully not that hard because we have this little separate microcontroller in the SOC, like a Cortex M0 essentially on the side of the normal CPUs, which had the ability to just stop the CPUs in place retrain DDR to a different frequency and then kick them off again. The main CPUs never really knew what did them. So this was pretty easy to implement, but we still needed uh, to put some code in. Like, we, we needed to host that code for this M0 in SRAM, of course, because DDR isn't accessible while we're changing frequencies. Um, and we had some more fun with uh, trying to work around hardware bugs. So this is a, a particular thing where when it goes into system suspend and it gets a wake interrupt at just the right time, like just after you turned off the main CPU, then sometimes it wouldn't wake up again. So to work around that, you essentially needed something to sit around and wait until after all the CPUs uh, have been turned off and check for this condition and then clear it. So here comes our M0 to the rescue again, and we had to implement some code for that. All of this still fit pretty nicely into SRAM, but then we had a great idea on how to save some more power. Um, wait, this is where I want to be which is essentially um, there was one more power rail we could turn off which powered most of the chip and turning it off would have saved us really a bunch of uh, power. Unfortunately, it also powered the SRAM. So <laughs> at that point, we sort of have a problem because we can turn the system off, but when we turn it back on, we don't have anything to resume from. So the one good thing we had was we have this uh, little amount of PMU SRAM, which is sort of a separate... Uh, amount of SRAM that's implemented that's powered by a different power rail and would stay alive even if we turn this off. But now we have to start fitting all of this stuff in there, which is kind of awful. Um, the DDR in it stuff still kind of fits. Um, one of the problems that we also have here is that the 
entry point of the CPU when it comes back from resume, you can essentially only give the SOC the top 16 bits, so it has to be 64K aligned. Thankfully, the PMU SRAM is 64K aligned, but it needs to sit at the very top for that. And the M0 code also needs to be 4K aligned, because that's how the M0 works. So first of all, putting the whole M0 code that we have right now in there doesn't fit at all. There's no way. Um, so the idea was, rather than having one M0 image and giving it an argument of which of the two functions it's supposed to do, we could split it up and have two M0 images and then just always uh, give the M0 base address for the one we want to use when we kick it off. Um, this sort of works, but uh, if you can see between these two, it overlaps part of the DDR and its stuff, so it doesn't quite fit. And it needs to be in the middle there because it needs to be 4K line. So this also didn't quite work. But then we realized um, the DDR in it has to start at 64K, but after that, it's really just normal code. So we can really sort of rip it apart and sandwich it carefully around the M0 code. And come on. With a lot of, um, you know, juggling bits and uh, counting instructions, we managed to get this all in 8K. Um, you have one problem left if you do all this, which is that uh, since you lose SRAM and S3, of course, you lose that DDR frequency scaling stuff. So it would be not that great if uh, DDR frequency scaling worked after you boot it, but then once you suspend resume and once it doesn't work anymore. So the ugly but obvious solution is to cache it in DRAM. I think this thing is dying there. Um, and then just copy it back every time we uh, resume, essentially. So if you want to look how this madness looks in the linker script, I got it over here. Can we switch, switch the slides manually? Thanks. Um, so the, the ink bin stuff is essentially the M0 code, so you see it needs to be 64K aligned. And then even though the, the other stuff is the same program, if we put the data section beyond that, it just happens to magically work out, and we're just hoping that we never have a compiler change or anything that messes all of this up again, because <laughs> it's going to be the most awful thing. Um, if you want to see some, some details about uh, how you do this sort of thing, where you build the binary for a completely different chip inside the same software as the main, like inside your main software package and link it all together, it's somehow done like this. So first of all, like you essentially first build that M0 code completely separate into a strip binary. And then you would define a makefile rule for the main software where that binary is another dependency for, the, uh, for, for one of the C files. And you also pass the name of that binary in as a, as a uh, preprocessor macro. And then you can use this uh, weird assembly instruction called ink bin, which essentially just tells the assembler to, at this point, include a whole other file completely and then continue assembling. And then you put a label around of it and then you can access it from C code and tell the um, M0 base address register, like just put, put the address in there and then it sort of work out. And um, this is the M0 code we run on suspend in the end. As you can see, it's really simple and really stupid. There's essentially this, uh, suspend state, which keeps counting upwards uh, as you go through the suspend and then again as you go through the resume later. As you can see, we had some other issues we also had to work around in the end. Like as you keep testing more and more on the platform, you keep finding more things. Um, this is actually where the system is suspended in here. So um, if you take one of these Chromebooks today and you close the lid, then <clears throat> even though it's supposed to save power, the whole time where the lid is closed, you have this little Cortex M0 saying in a tight loop, am I already resumed? Am I already resumed? Am I already resumed? But it turns out that M0s don't eat a lot of power. And if you do that on a 32 kilohertz clock, it's actually not as crazy as it sounds. You just shouldn't know how the sausage is made in that case. Um, yeah, that's all I have. So thanks for listening. Does anyone have any questions? All right, thanks so far. Uh, questions? Uh, why does the DDR3 controller need to be reinitialized uh, after S3 resume? Um, why, for instance, can't the hardware put that in self-refresh and that boots? It works, basically. Right, so this is not the DDR itself, right? So the, D the DDR chip on the board is put into self-refresh, but the DDR controller on the SOC needs to know how to talk to the DDR, and yeah. that part isn't uh, maintained mostly to save power, so 
we shut off most parts of the SOC when we go into S3, and that's one of the parts we shut off. So after the boot, you need something to tell the DDR controller how the DDR chip, like how many rows, banks, and columns, and that, so on you have, and to tell it to take the DDR out of self-refresh, and all that kind of code needs to live somewhere. And second question, uh, why don't you uh, do the initialization part uh, like a normal boot, in the, like in core boot on it x86? Uh? Are you asking why we're not reading it from Flash? Or? Uh, yes, why, why aren't you doing it di di dynamically uh, from code that is in Flash? Right. No, not necessarily um, saving data sorry. on Flash, but... Uh. Um, you can do that. It sort of depends on the SOC. So this SOC in particular, I think, was designed to resume from SRAM. So I'm not sure if uh, ah. starting the boot ROM again from Flash would even be possible. Okay. The other reason you might not want that is uh, it sort of depends on what, how your system is designed. In our case, um, this is a Chromebook. So Chromebooks are always designed in a way to boot from a read-only partition and then do some crypto magic before we jump into the partition we can actually update on the Flash. And um, we found out in the past that tying the resume path to this read-only Flash is a very bad idea, because that means that if you ever have a problem in your resume path, in your early resume path, you can't really fix it. So resuming from SOM is very nice, because then you can always update it. And you're, you're not bound to the stuff you have uh, put on Flash, essentially. More questions? Yep. That's uh, sorry, going back to one of your very uh, this one? Yeah, yep. Going back to one of your earlier slides, um, you've replaced the early stages of trusted firmware with Cobot code. Um, I'm not a trusted firmware architect or expert, but I'm sure it would alarm those who are, because the the, the, the whole root of trust derives from the early stages of, of the trusted firmware. Right. I mean, so it always depends on what you want to do with the system, right? So trusted firmware has many, uh, many things it does and many use cases. Um, they do have a system of trusted boot where every stage uh, verifies the next, but of course you don't have to use that. Um, in this case, the goal was essentially to get core boot working on ARM64, and what we needed was a secure monitor. So we just took the secure monitor that existed and didn't really care about the other things. Um, if you want trusted boot, core boot has its own way of trusted boot, uh, which is derived from the uh, way that Chrome OS initially did it, which is called verified boot, vboot. And um, the trusted, the BL31 in this case is part of that. So the way the core boot work, uh, way works is you, you boot from a read-only partition of the flash, you verify the read-write partition of the flash, and then you boot from there. And trusted firmware is just one of the different components that are stored in this read-write partition. So we have our own trusted boot mechanism, essentially, and we're just using a component of trusted firmware in there. Thank you. So if you had, like, the ability to tell the SOC guys here how to redesign their SRAM, would you just say, don't turn off the SRAM, or did you like having the two partitions for power reasons, or what's your feeling on that? Um, I'm not a power guy, so I don't know how much SRAM itself actually takes. I think in this case, it was sort of a design problem of uh, just tying everything to this one big power rail. So if you turn that off, it was really other components that we wanted to turn off, but the SRAM just happened to also hang on there. So it would probably be better to put SRAM on a separate rail or put it on, a, on a, an always-on rail, essentially, that's supposed to stay alive. But the problem is um, what we did on this chip is essentially something that the chip wasn't really designed for. We just figured out afterwards, hey, this is something we could, in theory, turn off, maybe if we just do it right. Um, I also think the idea of having split SRAM is not that bad, so 8K is unfortunately not that much, so having something like 16K, 32K would be much easier to work with, and then, then maybe that's good enough and you can turn off the main SRAM. Um, what kind of information are you passing from core boot to the firmware? Um, so the core, core boot uh, table base address for one. Uh, the other things that we usually pass is uh, some information specific to the board. So we had this design philosophy when doing this to try to not 
pull board specific information into trusted firmware because most of the stuff trusted firmware deals with is only specific to the SOC, so how to turn off CPUs on and off. It doesn't really care about the rest of the components on the board. And if we had a notion of the board in trusted firmware, essentially it would make the whole thing way more complicated because every board that we implement with that SOC would have its own code in there and it would just become more complicated. So what we decided to do is in those few cases where the trusted firmware needs to know something about the board, this is for example when it wants to reboot, it, like it needs a way to reboot and on some systems we reboot to, through an external GPIO, on others we use some SOC internal mechanism. So in that case uh, we would have a parameter that tells trusted firmware which reboot mechanism to use and that way we can tell it board specific information and don't need to hard code board specific code in there. Okay, I'm just telling you because uh, now in the firmware we support uh, dynamic configuration which basically consists on passing a device tree between images. So maybe this is something that you could use in the future. Right, um, yeah, I've heard about that. I'm, I wasn't sure that if it's finished yet or not, but it's uh, definitely something we'll uh, look into. For the next I, I'm platform. not sure how it would work in your case with skipping the first stages of the mm -hmm. firmware, but yeah, it's, I'm sure it, it could work. And we are already using it in some reference code for passing arguments between images to, for example, share memory between different images. Okay. So yeah, I'm pretty sure it could work as to pass addresses for a peripheral or something. So is it an interface between BL2 and BL3.1 or? Uh, right now, as far as I know, we are using it between BL1 and BL2, but mm -hmm. there's no reason why we couldn't use it in BL3.1. Right, so I think that is the extension essentially that we are still waiting on before we can skip yeah. to a better mechanism, yeah. Hi, what's the boot time penalty now that you have to use um, ARM trusted firmware? Um, it's usually not that bad because uh, it doesn't do a lot doing boot, it just sets up. So um, trusted firmware is not to do, supposed to do any SOC initialization, we have all of that in core boot. So really all it does on boot is setting up its own stuff and then passing on to the next part and it's really only meant to do these one-time services. So it's usually below 15 milliseconds to go through the trusted firmware part. Yep, um, just out of curiosity, I think on that Rockchip platform there was a dedicated microcontroller for um, the DRAM suspend stuff. Uh, the DCF, can you tell us the story about that and why it's, uh, it was replaced by the N0? Yeah, um, I don't think I can remember all the details. Um, the DCF was this thing that they implemented specifically to do the frequency uh, switching and it was like their own little microcontroller with only a couple of instructions and really crazy thing essentially that like we didn't have an assembler for that we had to ask them for code for it and I don't really remember the details but at some point essentially we found something that we needed to do during the frequency scaling that we couldn't with the DCF and then we thought why are we doing this if we just have a full ARM core there that can do everything and it's fully general purpose so we switched using that. Oh, we still have room for another two questions, maybe? In, in terms of whether to use the, like, you know, you, you pulled the one part out, and then the question was, you know, what about those earlier parts? Do you know their policy on you know, booting versus bricking. In other words, the core boot thing is it'll always come up and it'll just tell you things didn't go well. But do you know what the ARM stuff does? In that case, I'm just curious. I, I'm not really familiar, honestly, with those other two parts. Um, okay. But the thing is that um, I think it's a very thin framework, so a lot of this stuff is left to the platform and the platform is supposed to figure those kinds of things out, like what happens if it fails or something. I think the actual generic framework parts for BL1 and BL2 are very, very lightweight and don't really do that much. All right, uh, if there are no more questions, then okay. thanks Thank again much. very much, Julius.